Hi everybody, this is Raspberry Pi 5 and this is a TPM20 add-on board for it. I designed this two-layer printed circuit board using the free and open source software KiCad. It connects over SPI and in this video I'm going to uh, walk you through all the steps of the design process. Huge thanks to the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. They helped me with this prototype. If you need a high quality printed circuit board, visit PCBWay.com. Furthermore, they can help you with the assembly of various components on your board. But that's not all, PCBWay also can help you with a nice case for your board. They offer CNC machining, 3D printing, metal sheet fabrication and even injection molding. PCBWay.com is a one-stop shop for your next great gadget. TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. Version 2 of the standard has been here for a while, but it became more popular because Microsoft Windows 11 mandatory requires it. However, you can use TPM20 modules on Linux distributions, including, as in this case, on Raspberry Pi. The TPM is useful for securely cryptographically storing keys that can be used for um, secure boot or uh, full disk encryption. Furthermore, the TPM modules also offer harder random number generation. On the market, there are several appropriate integrated circuits that we can use to create a TPM20 add-on board for Raspberry Pi. I decided to use Infineon SLB9672 TPM20 chip. It is widely available, I purchased it from Mauser and it's also available from other distributors of electronic components. The datasheet contains all the details, there are two different device names depending on the model. One of them is for the standard temperature range from minus 20 to plus 85 degrees Celsius and the other one XU is for the enhanced industrial temperature range from minus 40 up to 85 degrees Celsius. The datasheet also contains the exact pinout of the integrated circuit. Table 4 from the datasheet is very important. It defines the power supply, the pins that have to be connected to 3.3 volts on the Raspberry Pi and the pins that have to be connected to ground. Table 5 provides additional details. In order to be compliant with the TCG specifications, I've also connected pin number 8 to 3.3 volts and pin number 16 to ground. To design this little green printed circuit board with the Optiga SLB9672 TPM20 chip, I use the free and open source software KiCad. It works on Microsoft Windows, Mac OS and Linux distributions. I'm personally using it on Ubuntu. The first step is to uh, create the schematics. Everything is open source, I have uploaded the whole KiCad project in GitHub. First, let's load the schematics editor. Following the recommendations in the datasheet of SLB9672 TPM20 chip, the power supply pins should be bypassed to ground with capacitors located close to the device. This part of my design strictly follows section 3.1 typical schematic and figure 2 from the datasheet. According to it, I have placed 4 capacitors with the same values as in the datasheet. For the SPI communication, we have MISU, MOSI and QUOC, which should correspond to the pins on the 40-pin header of Raspberry Pi. Furthermore, I have placed 10K pull-up resistors for cable select, interrupt and reset pins. As you can see in the video, I run the electrical rule checker in the schematics editor of KiCad to verify that there are no errors. The second step is to assign footprints to the components on the schematics. After that, I can proceed with the PCB view where I have to create the edge cuts and to place all traces. This is a challenge because this is a really small board. The size of the resistors is 0603. In KiCad schematics editor, I have also assigned an appropriate footprint for the SLB 9672 chip. The package of this integrated circuit is called UQFN32. Let's open the PCB editor. Obviously the board is ready so we're just doing an overview. It is uh, 
two layer printed circuit board we have traces on both layers and vias that connect them i have created a zone with a ground layer it has a hatched pattern you can see how this looks from the 3d view please pay attention and note the small squares uh, they are especially visible on uh, one of the sides of the board uh, this is the hatched pattern of the zone I have also placed appropriate labels on the front and the back seal screen. Uh, I'm going to order this board to be green with white seal screen. After completing the design of the printed circuit board, the next step is to export the so-called Gerber and Drill files. Think of these files as PDF files for printing. However, in this case, these files are actually the schematics based on which the manufacturer will make the products for me. Huge thanks to PCB way for making these prototypes. In the video, you see how to export the Gerber and the drill files. After that, I've archived them as zip, uploaded them to pcbway.com, placed an order, and in a few days, it was delivered. I recorded the really exciting unboxing moment. So here are the prototypes of this small green printed circuit board with the white labels. The quality is amazing. It's very good for a prototype. And I can proceed with the next step, which means to solder the components on it. But before that, let's have a closer look at the printed circuit board. The dimensions are 18.4 by 12.9 millimeters. Thanks to PCB Way, I have a prototype and now comes the hard part because I don't have a stencil and this board has several SMT components. So using my hand soldering scales, I'm going to solder one of these prototypes. First, I'm going to proceed with the SMT components and after that, the true hole component, which is actually this header here. Keep in mind that this board has been designed in a way that it can be vertical like this, uh, this version, which is useful uh, for Raspberry Pi 5 as it does not interfere with the cooling fan and uh, the heatsink, but it can be also soldered on a header that has no angle and in this way uh, the, t the TPM2 module will be horizontal. Let me be honest with you, the soldering wasn't easy. It took me a while, primarily because I didn't have a stencil. So this is a prototype. I just needed one board. I started by hand soldering some of the SMT components. The hardest part, of course, comes because of the Infineant SLB9672 chip. It has a package called UQFN32. The uh, distance between the pins is very small, so it's very hard to solder it. I carefully placed some solder with the soldering iron on the PCB before placing the chip on top of it and uh, putting the whole PCB on this hot plate. Thanks to the magic of video editing, I'll fast forward. I don't want to bore you, so everything in the video happens really fast, but in reality, I kept the PCB on the hot plate for about a minute. Typically, if everything is okay, the final step is to hand solder the true hole components. As I explained, in this case, I have a single true hole component. This is the female header that has two rows and five pins on each row. In theory, that's it. In practice, it didn't work out. So I didn't record this, but through a magnifying glass, I carefully inspected all the solder joints for the pins on the TPM chips and fix them because some of them were shorted. Here is a closer look at the solder joints of the final result. This is the SLB9672 chip soldered on our two layer printed circuit board. I have to admit that I burned the board so you can see the scars on the other side. However, the prototype works so it's fine. In order to test this TPM20 module, I have to enable the proper device tree binary overlay in the config.txt file on the Raspberry Pi, and I need to include in my distribution TPM tools. This is a set of command line um, commands with which I can interact with the TPM20 module. Although I can do this with the Raspberry Pi OS, which is probably uh, the most widely used 
operating system for Raspberry Pi, I decided to have a different approach and I built my own custom Linux distribution using the Yocto project and Open Embedded. If this is something new for you, have a look at my tutorials about getting started with the Yocto project and Open Embedded on Raspberry Pi 5. Let's proceed with the test. On my desk I have Raspberry Pi 5 and a brand new prototype that I've just assembled, the TPM20 add-on board for Raspberry Pi. I have to attach it to the 40 pin header on the Raspberry Pi 5. I have to leave the first 8 pins from the right to left empty and to attach our add-on board on the 9th pin. This is the pinout of the Raspberry Pi 40 pin header. We need 10 pins in total, the 3.3 volts on pin number 17, the MOSI MISO and clock on pins 19, 21 and 23, as well as the ground on pin 25. This automatically means that our add-on board will also occupy the following pins on the other row, pins number 18, 20, 22, 24 and 26. As explained at the beginning of the video, this module can be either horizontal or vertical depending on the female header. In this case our prototype is vertical and there is no conflict even if we are using the fan and the heatsink for Raspberry Pi 5. It's very important to pay attention to the direction of the module, note the position of the chip when adding it to the Raspberry Pi 40 pin header. In order to get this hardware working, we need a proper software driver. In the Linux kernel, device tree is a concept for software description of hardware components. The device tree source files are compiled either to device tree binary files or to device tree binary overlays files. Although there are some minor pin differences between SOB9672 and SOB9670, the SPI communication is the same, therefore the device tree binary overlay for SOB9670 is fully compatible with SOB9672 that we're using. As you can see, the fork of the Linux kernel for Raspberry Pi in GitHub contains the device tree source for the device tree binary overlay that we need. Using an appropriate USB to UART debug dongle, I connected the Raspberry Pi 5 to one of my ThinkPad laptops. I'm using Ubuntu 2404 on this ThinkPad. I opened a terminal and using the screen command, I'm going to interact over the serial uh, console with the Raspberry Pi 5. As I mentioned, using the Yocto project and Open Embedded, I built my own custom Linux distribution for Raspberry Pi 5 that has the device tree binary overlay for the TPM module and also features the TPM tools in the Linux user space. I've logged in as user root without a password. Immediately after that, I've grabbed through the dmessage output to see if the TPM has been detected. So far so good, there are some log messages coming out from the kernel about the TPM20 module. For better visibility, let's have a look from another point of view. At the end of the config.txt file, I have added the line dt overlay equals to tpm-slb9670. This is the device tree binary overlay that I've explained you when we had a look at the source code. TPM tools also offer a command to run a self-test. Let's use it. Although I run the tpm2 self-test command with the argument verbose, uh, it didn't print out a lot of information on the screen. However, there is another command tpm2 underscore get test results which shows that the test has passed successfully. Everything is okay. This is a huge success because this means that uh, the prototype of the tpm20 board uh, built around Optiga SLB9672 uh, works fine, it's detected by the custom Linux distribution that I built, um, everything is working properly and I can interact with the TPM20 module. At the beginning of the video, when I introduced TPM modules, I told you that they can be also used as external hardware random generators. The command tpm2 underscore get random returns the next size octets from the random number generator. The size parameter is expected to be something like 8 or 16 or 32, something up to 48. The hex argument to this command converts the output data to hex format without deleting 
0x. As you can see in the video, I've executed this command with these arguments and it returned various random numbers in hex format. One more thing for the people still watching this video. Probably you have noticed the small text on the printed circuit board that says revision 1.1 and you might be wondering what happened to revision 1.0. So here is a quick look at revision 1.0 of this TPM module for Raspberry Pi. I forgot to properly wire one of the power pins to 3.3 volts. Because of this, I did this hardware patch with the small wire. Although I'm proud that with my soldering skills I was able to make this harder patch, it's a shame that I didn't properly pay attention to the datasheet the first time when I designed this printed circuit board. Anyway, this is fixed in revision 1.1 which was demonstrated in this video. At the end of the video, let's quickly summarize. I've designed a TPM20 add-on board for Raspberry Pi using the free and open source software KiCad. The whole project is available at GitHub. Uh, the PCB is built around Optigo TPM SLB9672. It's connected over the SPI pins on the Raspberry Pi 40 pin header. Finally, I tested it with the TPM tools, which is an open source project also hosted in GitHub and provides command line tools for inter interacting with TPM20 modules. This prototype works, which means that I can proceed by ordering um, a panel with multiple boards, a stencil and properly assembling more of these boards so that other people can use them. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was interesting to walk through the process how to design a um, two-layer printed circuit board with uh, Optiga SLB9672 TPM20 chip that we can use on Raspberry Pi. In next videos, I'm gonna explain in more details the software side of things and how we can actually interact in more interesting way with this TPM. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and hit the like button. Stay tuned for new videos.